John chapter 12 and from verses 20 through to 26. Let's hear God's word. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. This is God's word. Fairly common phrase these days is to say that something is counterintuitive. Perhaps you've heard of that. That's a counterintuitive way of expressing yourself. Well, that's a counterintuitive idea. When we say that something is counterintuitive, what we're saying is not just that this is different from what we expect. What we're saying is that it is different from what we assume is the only way that something could be. Counterintuitive. So, for instance, intuitively... We assume that the world is flat. It looks flat. It feels flat. Therefore, intuitively, we assume it must be flat. But we know and have known for many, many years that the world is, in fact, round. It spins, too, by the way at about a thousand miles an hour. All of us sitting here are sitting on a massive globe spinning around at a thousand miles an hour. Doesn't feel like that. Intuitively, it doesn't seem to be right. But we know it is right. This morning, we are looking at the most counterintuitive principle in the Bible. We assume that the way to have the best life, the way to have the kind of life you've always dreamed of, the way to live the dream, the way to have the best life is to love your life. To do what it is that you are dreaming about, to follow your ambitions, your dreams, to love your life. We assume that is the way to have the best life, the life that you dream to have. But Jesus is saying that that common intuition is, in fact, incorrect. Now, remember, if you will, that we're looking at John's gospel, and John has written his gospel, this book, this story of Jesus, for a particular purpose. Each of the gospels have a particular take on the life of Jesus that they're intending to communicate, and John has a particular purpose in writing his gospel, and that purpose is that we might have life to the full. And so he records Jesus as saying that I've come to, have, to give you life and life to the full, or life abundantly. He records Jesus as saying that uh, he is the one in whom we have life. In him, he says, that is in Jesus is life. And remember, we are now at the stage in this story of John, John's gospel about Jesus, where Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, the great religious center of the Israelites. And remember, it is the feast of Passover, and there are these great crowds, perhaps as many as a million people, according to one historian, a contemporary historian called Josephus, perhaps as many as a million people who have gathered to celebrate God's salvation of his Old Testament people through the sacrifice of a lamb. And Jesus, who John has said is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, is now going up to Jerusalem at Passover. 
So this second half of John's gospel is sometimes called the book of glory, for all now is focused on the glorification of Jesus through his death and resurrection by which and in whom we can have life. And Jesus is teaching us here that this life, this life to the full that he has come to give us comes about through this most counterintuitive principle in the Bible. Begins in verse 20. There, there is this sudden, strange appearance of Greeks. John says, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast, that is Passover, were some Greeks. Now, you should know that when John tells us that there were Greeks there, he does not mean necessarily that these were people from Greece. In those times, you see, the world was divided in people's minds into the Jewish people and all the rest. And the rest of the world was the Greek world or the Hellenistic world. These are people, God-fearers, who have come to worship at the feast, they're fearing God, who are not ethnically Jewish, but are from the world outside the Jewish people, the Greeks, the non-Jewish part of the Roman Empire. So it was not surprising, actually, that there were Greeks in Jerusalem at this time. People from all over the world came to Jerusalem for the great feast of Passover. What is surprising is what they want. Look at verse 21. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now, why did they go to Philip with this uh, request? Perhaps because Philip's name was a Greek, non-Jewish name. Perhaps also because they realized that being from Galilee, he was close to the non-Jewish part of the world and therefore would understand not only their language, but have empathy with their desire. Philip was from near the border. And these people who were from outside of Israel approached him first to be, as it were, their representative into the inner courts of uh, Jerusalem and to be able to see Jesus. Look what they want then. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. What a contrast to the Pharisees who wish to kill Jesus. Here, the Greeks, the foreigners, those ethnically outside of God's people, the outcasts, they are wanting to see Jesus. They've got it right. They've, they've heard about Jesus. There has been this massive crowd of the triumphal entry. Jesus is famous. And in unwitting fulfillment to the Pharisees' jealous comment in verse 19 that the whole world has gone after Jesus, here come the Greeks. The wider world is now wanting to see Jesus. I remember when I was interviewing someone who came from a Sikh background. He'd been a part of the Sikh religion his family had for generations. He was a, from a Sikh background. He'd become a Christian. He wanted to be baptized. And at that time in my ministry, I was having conversation with many college students about many apologetic and sort of complicated philosophical things and all the rest. And I was fascinated to discover that this person from a Sikh background who had come to follow Jesus, his request was much more in line with these Greeks. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Let that be your watchword, your slogan, your motto, your guiding principle. When you go to church, when you go to small group, when you go to adult community, when you're thinking about the things of God, we wish to see Jesus. You know, sometimes it takes a person outside of your community, perhaps less used to church. Someone here this morning who is discovering these things for the first time, who has this heart desire to show us, the rest of us, to bring us back to the real center of our own faith and bring our faith back into focus. A child, a teenager, we can get so wrapped up in all the other things of Christendom or culture, all this other stuff, here we can then miss the main thing. So would you pray this week that you would simply want to see Jesus? So we come to verse 22. Philip went and told Andrew this amazing thing, and Andrew and Philip together then went and told Jesus. 
You see, Andrew, we know from elsewhere in the Bible, came from the same city as Philip, so perhaps they were close, or Andrew was the person you went to when you wanted to bring someone to Jesus. You know, every time Andrew is mentioned in John's gospel, he is bringing someone to Jesus. Every time. What an example. We have this month a focus on inviting people to church. There are postcards available to help us invite people to church at the back of church this morning. Could you be an Andrew? I uh, wrote a blog this week on how to invite people to church, and my mindset on this changed when I wanted to invite a certain person to church. I didn't know how to go about it. Uh, We went kayaking together. I quite like going kayaking occasionally, and we were sort of, you know, paddling along together, talking about various things. Finally, I plucked up enough courage to invite him to church, and I will never forget his reply. I didn't know you wanted me to come. And when I'd assured him, I did. We went to church together. Most people do not come to church because they are unsure what they would need to do when they get there. We take it all for granted. They don't know. Perhaps you are in that category. Someone has invited you. We are glad you are here. You have had an Andrew who has invited you to come along and find out more about Jesus. You know, 90% of people today will go to church only if someone invites them personally. Philip told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. They brought this opportunity to Jesus. Perhaps you can be an Andrew to someone this week week. Well, now we come to the heart of this passage, which runs from verse 23 to the end of verse 26. And here is this counterintuitive, the most counterintuitive principle in the Bible. Jesus, though, is not saying actually several different things here. He's saying one thing in several different ways to help us get the point. Let me read it out again and explain as we go along. So look at verse 23. And Jesus answered them, That confuses some people. But when it says Jesus answered them, we think that in English it must mean he's replying to a specific question. But the meaning here is that he is responding to this situation. So the Greeks, that is the non-Jewish God-fearers, are now coming to Jesus, wanting to see Jesus. And Andrew and Philip bring this situation to Jesus, and Jesus answered them. Or as we would say, And Jesus responded to this situation by saying. What did he say? Second half of verse 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So remember, the second part of John's gospel is called the book of glory. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This is the time or the hour when the Son of Man, that is Jesus, is going to be glorified. His hour or his time has now come. So far throughout John's gospel, we've been told it is not yet his hour, but now the hour has come. This is the moment. There is building tension and pressure. We are approaching the climax. Everything in the Christian story hinges upon this hour upon this moment, this moment in time. The Son of Man, referring to the prophecy in Daniel of a divine human figure who would come at the end to bring about salvation and a term that Jesus uses to refer to himself. The hour has come for the Son of Man, that is Jesus, to be glorified. He is going to be glorified. Now we begin to enter into this counterintuitive principle. He's going to be glorified through his death and resurrection. The whole world is coming to him. The salvation of the world is going to be through him. And the immediate evidence of that is these Greeks come from outside the Jewish world who now want to see Jesus. So now is the time. Now is the moment. Now is the hour when Jesus is going to be glorified. Now, Here then is a spiritual diagnostic for us all this week, for any teaching we come across and for ourselves as well. This spiritual diagnostic question is the following, where is the glory? Where do we think that we will be glorified? Where do you think God is glorified? Is the glory where Jesus says the glory is? In the cross? 
A college student uh, was faced with a highly influential Christian spiritual movement. It was doing what seemed at the time to be a lot of good things. He asked one simple diagnostic question. Is the cross of Jesus central to what you are doing? And when they answered honestly that the cross was important but not central, the college student rightly did not associate himself with that group. And in time to come, that group gradually lost its spiritual vitality. Where is the glory? In creation? In social action? In end time speculation? In ministry programs? According to Jesus, the hour when he is glorified is at the cross. What does that mean? Well, so he begins to explain, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, this is a parable in a sentence. We need to see it to understand it. And because most of us, I suppose, are not farmers, the picture of what Jesus is saying does not immediately jump into many of our minds. But it is a simple and straightforward picture once we see it. Here's the farmer. He sows a seed, a seed of wheat. When you sow a seed, it is almost as if that grain of wheat dies. You put it in the ground. The ground is hard and stony or wet and moist, but either way, it's still put under the earth. You bury the seed. The seed and its seediness is being put to death. The seed, the grain of wheat, will be no more. It must die to its seediness. And at the end of the process, there'll be no more seed left. It will all be gone. It has been put in the ground. It's been put to death. It is dead and buried. And in due course, at this time, this hour, it will die, and then all that is the seed will be gone and no more. It is sown, it, it dies, it falls to the earth and dies. But look, says Jesus, if it did not fall to the earth and die, it would rain, remain alone. A grain of wheat that is not put in the ground does not produce any crop. There is no fruit. Nothing comes out of it. It is still just a grain of wheat, but there's nothing that results from that grain of wheat. It is just single solo, on its own, not fruitful, no crop, no results, a solitary grain of wheat. It is hard and gnarled, tough, but on its own it does nothing. Unless it falls into the earth and dies, it will not produce a crop. It will not produce a fruit. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. It dies, but if it does not, it will not produce any fruit. But look what happens if it does fall into the earth and die. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That single, solitary, hard, gnarled, solo, independent, individualistic, self-sufficient seed grain of wheat remains like that unless it dies and falls into the earth. But if it does, what great results. There is growth, there is productivity, a harvest is produced, there is fruit, there's a crop, fruit, much fruit that comes as a result. So the principle that Jesus is teaching here, that we must die to ourselves to find life to the full, is highly counterintuitive. So what he does, he takes an example from something that people at the time would have been familiar with, a sowing and reaping pattern that they would have watched and observed many times in order to illustrate that what he is about to teach makes sense within their own mind, within their own world view. Jesus often used illustrations or parables like this. Here is a parable in a sentence. Can you see that individualistic little hard grain of wheat? Nothing can come of that unless it dies. And then if it is sown into the earth and dies, well, wow, then look what happens. Much fruit, bountiful fruit, life to the full. 
So that's the principle, this counterintuitive principle that Jesus is illustrating with a familiar picture of farming, of a grain of wheat dying, as it were, and producing much fruit. This is where the glory is. This is what will happen. He will go to the cross and die and rise again, and there will be great fruit. The Greeks coming saying, sir, we wish to see Jesus, was just the beginning sign of this global harvest that was coming through Jesus' death and resurrection. He would, like a grain of wheat, be sown into the ground. He would be crucified, dead, and buried. But like a grain of wheat, by such sowing into the ground and dying, he would then rise again and produce great fruit to people all over the world, discovering this life to the full that he has to offer us through faith in him, through trusting him, through committing our lives to him. Now, you say, but what does that mean for you and me? Is this something that only applies to Jesus, or is this something that has any application to us? And so Jesus takes this principle, having illustrated it, and now applies it. The same pattern that he preeminently, ultimately, above all, represents this dying and coming back to life to produce much fruit, that same pattern is also to be true of his disciples, those of us who want to follow Jesus, those of us who want to discover this life to the full. And so he continues in verse 25 to apply the same principle of dying to produce much fruit to us ourselves. Verse 25, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now this is actually the first of three conditional statements here as he applies this principle of dying to produce fruit which he preeminently represents and through whom we can find life. He applies that same principle to our own lives too. Jesus is underlining that what he's offering is good, life to the full. And he's doing it by these three conditional statements. Each time the condition is a form of dying to yourself and the offer is made of what we will experience or have in terms of fruit as a result. The first condition here is not loving your life but hating your life. And the offer is that if we do this, we will have eternal life. But what does it mean to hate your life? The answer to that is that throughout the Bible, this is the heart of what I teach over and over again in terms of the God-centered life, throughout the Bible there is this story. In the beginning our lives were made to center on God. Our lives found fulfillment in putting God first and obeying his commands. That was how we were designed, but we rebelled against that. As a result, we live now in a world that is in rebellion against God. Our souls, our lives, ourselves are now orientated around the selfish self. To love our life in this sense is to do what we want rather than what God wants. In that sense, we should hate our lives. We should put to death this selfish self. See, the lie is that life is found by doing what we want, not what God wants. Ever since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, that lie reverberates through our psychology, our neuroses, our blindnesses, our wars, our conflicts. When we love our lives like this, we are really destroying our lives. Our lives are not made to center upon ourselves. Our lives are not made to do what we want and not do what God wants. That's like having a car and trying to get your engine to run by filling your gas tank to run on water. Oh, your gas tank was made to run on gasoline. That's what you were made for, to run on centering your life on God. If you love your life in this sense, that you try to run your life by centering your life on yourself, you will lose your life. It's not what your life is made for. If you do just what you want and ignore what God wants, you will destroy your life. You think you're doing what is best by loving your life, but really you're not. You're wrecking your life. If instead, Jesus says, you hate your life. That is, you don't do what your selfish self thinks it should do. You put God back in the center of life. You do what he wants. You become his disciple. You put gasoline in the 
gas tank of your life, then you will save your life. Your life will be centered on God. And while that may seem counterintuitively to be the way to ruin your life, making God your Lord and yourself submit to God as the center of your life, that is actually the way to save your life for all eternity. And so this first conditional statement, not loving your life but hating your life, understood as putting God in the center of your life for which we were all really designed and how we experience fullness of life, offers us eternal life therefore. And of course the call of this first conditional statement is therefore let us put God in the center of our lives, that is what we are made for. The next two conditional statements work this further out with this word serving. Each offers slightly different aspects of this life to the full that Jesus wants us to have. So how do you have life to the full? Counterintuitively, it isn't just about doing what you want. It's about putting God in the center of your life. And so then, the first part of verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If we serve Jesus, if we put God back in the center of our lives, that means following Jesus, and that means, Jesus says, we will be with Jesus. This is a precious promise and a great fulfillment of what it means to have life to the full. I wish I had the rhetorical flourish to express to you all all that it means to be with Jesus. Where I am, there will my servant be also. What could be better? What could be better than being with Jesus now and forever? At the name of Jesus, demons flee and fall. You, you could climb every mountain. You could swim every See, you could ski the Himalayas, climb the Alps, rock climb Yosemite National Park, scuba dive the Great Barrier Reef off Australia. You could have all the tea in China and the best coffee in Brazil and Kenya. You could run a marathon in a world-breaking time and bring home Olympic gold from the gymnastics all-around events. You could appear on the front cover of Vogue magazine and have your own star on Hollywood Boulevard. You could own a beachfront property in Malibu and San Diego, a retreat in Palm Springs too, a ranch in Colorado, a mansion on the North Shore of Chicago, and an apartment block on the Upper East Side of Manhattan overlooking Central Park. All this could be yours, and I tell you that that, all that, is nothing compared to simply being with Jesus. We say, well, why is that? How could that be the case? Oh, Jesus concludes this third conditional statement in the second half of verse 26. If anyone serves me, get this, the Father will honor him. Oh, in my view, here we come to the pinnacle of this counterintuitive principle. We had the seed sown, a person who dies themselves will experience life and life to the full. So if, conditional, if you put God at the center of your life, in that sense do not love your selfish self and instead put God at the center of your life as we were all made to do to experience life, then we will have eternal life. What is more, if you serve Jesus, you'll be with Jesus. What could be better than being with Jesus, the source of all life? He is life, in him is life, and life to the full. But then finally, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. How strange is this? From serving comes honor. And yet, so it is. As God says in 1 Samuel, those who honor me, I will honor. The real glory is in the cross. Honor comes from serving Jesus. Not always now, but always honor. These days, I get sent a lot of magazines and books asking for me to write endorsements and that kind of thing of what people are writing. 
And this week, I was sent a magazine which had a picture emblazoned on the front cover of the most unlikely looking person. You know the way, the usually, the way it usually works? They put the new hero, the latest shiny celebrity on the, on the front cover and try to get you to feel excited about the ministry based upon this bright, shiny, new leader type, put front and center and honored above all. But this ministry, this ministry did not do that. They had a quite ordinary looking person right on the front cover. Someone not famous, not well known, but now honored for what she has done. Now, we don't think of people who serve as likely to be the people who are honored, but so often that is the case. The one who helped you, that person, you are more likely to honor. I could tell you stories of apparently well-known people I have known, but the people I really want to honor are the people who have served me, helped me, come alongside me. There is this principle whereby counterintuitively, it is the one who serves who is the greatest, and the one who serves Jesus who is honored by God the Father himself. So we have this counterintuitive principle. The way to life to the full is to put yourself, your selfish self, that kind of so-called life to the death. Instead, you center your life upon Jesus. You serve him. You follow him. And as a result, you find life, eternal life. The very presence of Jesus himself in your life, honor from the Father God, that's glory. In short, the way to have life to the full is to follow the example of Jesus. What does that mean? It means sowing the seed of your life. That's the illustration Jesus uses. Don't hold on to yourself. Give yourself away. Don't try to amass things for yourself. Use them for his kingdom. Don't seek to be someone. Seek to serve someone. Really, it is what it means to become a Christian at all. It means to center your life upon Jesus, to put him in the driving seat. And then it is what it means to be an ongoing disciple of Jesus. This week, would you ask yourself these diagnostic questions? Where is the glory? Where do I think is the glory. Is it in the cross? And if the glory and honor and the life is in the cross, then well, what wonderful fruit there is from that. Honor from God the Father, life and life to the full, the very presence of Jesus in my life now and forever, all because we took that gnarled, hard, solitary, selfish, individualistic seed, a grain of wheat, and we sowed it. We let it fall into the earth, and it died. Died to self. That we might then rise with Jesus in the power of his Spirit to the life that he came to give you the life to the full. Let us pray together. First, a moment of quiet. Where do you think is the glory? Would you ask yourself that question this morning? He who serves me, says Jesus, the Father will honor. Now is the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified, the hour when the seed is sown. Lord, for those of us here this morning who do know you and follow you and love you, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to resist this so common idea that the way to find abundant life, fullness of life, 
is to do what we want, to amass things for ourselves. Lord, it seems hard to say you've got to die to yourself, and yet, if the Bible is true, then the selfish self is nothing but a principle of hell in our soul. Help us to see it for what it is. Not life, but death. And so, Lord, to submit to you, to put you at the heart of our lives, the center of our lives, and therefore, Lord, to have honor and eternal life and to be with you, Jesus, in short, this life to the full. Our Father, I pray for those of us here this morning who don't yet know you. I pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to this first principle of what it means to be a Christian. That is that Jesus, you came to die for us that we might have life forever. Help us therefore, Lord, to put you at the heart of our lives and submit to you that we might also rise to new life, spiritual life to the full now and life forever after death. Lord, these are not trivial things. These are important things, but they're not sad things, Lord. They're joyful things. They're fullness of life. Please help us to enter into that today, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.